YouTube's MXR Plays, Fair Use, Extortion, and the Muddy Middle of Copyright. Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to be responding to a story that came across my Twitter feeds and my social media. Again, kind of in the muddy middle of how YouTube operates, how fair use operates, when you can use content, when you can't. And exactly what happens when someone sends one of these nasty kind of cease and desist letters to you. Because one of the things that is being floated around that I've seen is whether or not such an action is extortionate. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. I've seen a couple of other lawyers uh, on my social media talk about whether or not this is extortion. Unfortunately, as you can probably tell from the title to my video, I view this particular issue as pretty much the muddy middle of copyright. And if you've followed this channel and if you've listened to me either on Help Us Out Hogue with the Easy Allies, talking about fair use, talking about use of another's intellectual property for your purposes, whether that's commentary, parody, or just making something off of what they have made, uh, you know that one of the main issues with fair use is that primarily it's a defense to a copyright infringement claim. So somebody can drag you into court, claim copyright infringement, and you can then defend with the concept of something being fair use. And we're going to talk about these definitions at length a little bit more so that you have the right legal kind of language to rely upon and to think about. Uh, But before we do that, I do want to give the disclaimer that if you are a YouTuber, if you are otherwise using this stuff, if you think that this case that we're about to talk about relates specifically to you, I have to give the disclaimer, this isn't official legal advice, right? This is commentary on something I'm looking at from afar. And while I think it's good commentary, I've talked about these issues with you before in virtual legality, and I will undoubtedly talk about them with you again. It is not specific to your facts and circumstances. And you, as you are about to see in this video, those facts and circumstances make the entire case on both sides, on whether or not you're permitted to use the intellectual property you're claiming to use, and on whether somebody can claim that you are infringing on their rights and are maybe extorting you in an unlawful manner. So without further ado, let's take a look at the actual issue here. This is related to a YouTube channel that I was not familiar with called MXR Plays. Uh, And they put up a video that at least went viral in my neck of the woods, the the law, Twitter, legal, social media neck of the woods. And it said, we are being extorted, which is a term of art in the law, for all of our money, and we don't know what to do anymore. And I said, okay, well, that's interesting. One of the things you'll note here is that they have 830,000 subscribers. One of the things that pops out in their video, and I'm not going to be using any video clips in this video because we don't want to have our own issues with copyright infringement, regardless of how we feel about whether or not it's valid or not. Uh, It doesn't make a lot of sense to just go and poke the bear on these kinds of things. So one of the things that always comes up here is why these people, right? Why these folks got this letter. uh, And we're about to talk about that letter in just a second. But one of the main reasons, and we've talked about this in virtual legality, is because they got the money. And no, 830,000 subscribers doesn't mean that they're rolling in it, but it means that they're rolling in it more than, say, Hoag Law Channel's 6,000 subscribers. And at some point, the people that own these videos, whether they're trolls, whether they own them or not, and they're going to just make trouble for you, and they're going to extort you, and they're going to act illegally, if that's what you think happened here, that's going to take place only when they think there's a significant enough pot of money to go after. So the question here raised, you know, why did this happen to us? Why does it happen to us and not... X, Y, or Z, who does a very similar thing to us. One of the answers to that question is the people that do this kind of thing evaluate where there are pockets to go and get money out of and where there are not, and they pick and choose their opponents on that premise. So here, you've got 830,000 subscribers. They presume you're making some money. You've got a Patreon here advertised. You've got some money to go after, or at least these folks think that you do, and that's one of the reasons why this becomes an issue. But these folks in general, and I looked at the videos here in question uh, that we're about to talk about, they take uh, viral videos uh, or meme videos uh, that presumably they find on the internet somewhere, and they comment over them. Uh, and we'll, we'll take a look at what that looks like for a, a second here. Uh, but that's primarily what they do, as best I can tell. And if you've got better information on this particular YouTube channel, let me know uh, in the comments to this video. Uh, But that's what appears to have happened here is that they had these videos that they found on the internet that are viral, and they put their video up in the top corner and they comment on them. And the end result of that process uh, was this. So here's the tweet that I saw and that was linked to me a couple times. It says, MXR, MMOX review, here are the charges Junkin Media gave me 
$3,000 for a single meme because it contained footage from two of their clips. If I don't pay this, they'll strike and take down my channel. So we go and we click on this and it says Junkin Media Settlement Fees. Already a good sign. This means in general, this is what they do uh, on a day-to-day basis. They send these things out to various people. And you see here, charge by video. Uh, So they've essentially identified four separate videos that they think uh, infringe on their rights to videos that they own. And they have asked for $1,500 in settlement of each. So one, the one thing we note is that they aren't distinguishing between the various usages, regardless of how long they were, what kind of commentary was on top of them or not. It's just always $1,500. You violated our rights. And so we are going to now go and ask for $1,500 from you. Now, that's a lot of money, obviously. One of the things that pops up there is, is it too much money? When you start talking about whether something is extortionate, one of the main kind of functions is, are you going and misrepresenting what somebody's legal exposure is to you? in order to encourage them to settle, to pay you money. And if you get way too far afield from what is actually a legitimate source of damages, what you would actually be able to go and get from a court, it's possible that someone could turn around on you and say, you are trying to extort me. And we're gonna talk about that towards the end of this video. For the most part, you think, hey, Rick, isn't that what a lawsuit is in all cases? You go, you send somebody a threatening letter and say, if you don't settle with me, we're gonna sue you. Yep, absolutely, that's allowed. But if you go and you say, hey, we're also going to take, you know, $600 million from you if you don't settle for 30000 then if you start to use misrepresentations, if you start to use the law as a cudgel in a way that you know factually is inaccurate, you can start to get into trouble with these kinds of wire fraud or interstate extortionate communications statutes that we're going to talk about uh, in just a minute. Now, Junkin Media actually responded to this tweet uh, and they said, we left a comment on your video. Here's a screenshot. You are making money off of videos that don't belong to you. Our only goal here is to ensure that the rightful owners of the videos are compensated. We're happy to talk and try to find a resolution that works for everyone. Let's actually take a look at what they copied here from their comment to the video. They say, hi, we'd like to take the chance to respond to this. For starters, it's important to understand that we provide a service for video creators. We allow them to list their content on our website so that TV shows, publishers, YouTubers, influencers, or advertisers can buy a license to use their content. It's no different from a company like Shutterstock, where photographers or videographers can make their content available for sale. Only, we specialize in viral style videos. As we've mentioned repeatedly, you can completely avoid any issues related to copyright by simply licensing videos on our website for $49. Now that's, let's stop right there for just a second. That's interesting, right? They actually say in their comment, hey, you could have bought this for $49. Only we're not going to ask you for $1,500, which is an order of magnitude above that $49 price. So you look at this and you say, well, what is that $1,500 about? If you're actually going to come out in writing in a comment to this and say, you could have made this all right for $49, there is some ability for someone that has been uh, essentially infringed upon to say, no, we don't offer you the license anymore because you're a bad actor and you actually owe us damages and we think we lost you know, $1,500 on your use of the video. But obviously with a one-page settlement price that we just saw that was delivered to MXR, that doesn't exist there. And instead, all we have to go on is the fact that they usually sell rights to this for $49, and now they're asking for $1,500. That's the kind of fact pattern where you, you step back and you say, that actually does start to look like somebody coming into your shop and saying, hey, nice place you got here. It would be a shame if something were to happen to it which is, of course, the kind of standard Goodfellas mob movie version of extortion, which we don't get necessarily in YouTube commentary, but it starts to look like that. It's not a good look for Jukin Media. And so we press on with their statement, but on the understanding that it's now starting to look a little fishy. We have no ill will towards you or your channel. We'd like nothing more than for you to license content using our website, or if you'd rather not, Another option is simply not to use our videos that you don't have permission to use. YouTube policy is clear on this. It says you should only upload content, including music, videos, and artwork that you created or that you're authorized to use. Now that's a little sleight of hand, right? Because we're about to talk about fair use here. And fair use is deliberately and explicitly written into the Copyright Act to essentially say if you are using something for fair use, you do not infringe. Under the law, that is authorization. And we're also going to talk about the fact that DMCA abuse, takedown notice abuse, essentially now requires people that are going to hit that button and claim abuse to do a fair use analysis. 
that you are supposed to think about whether or not it's fair use before you actually hit the button. You put a copyright strike on somebody, you threaten their livelihood. In effect, you're taking other people's videos without asking them, then posting them to your channel and making money off of them. By visiting our website and paying a modest $49 license fee to use videos, you'd be making sure the video's rightful owners are compensated while also ensuring that your channel remains free of copyright issues. Again, shame if something were to happen to it. As always, we're happy to discuss your situation and try to come to a reasonable solution moving forward. We'd also be willing to discuss some kind of longer-term deal that would allow you to have access to our entire library of 60,000 videos. We never want to issue copyright strikes. We have a duty to do so to protect the copyright of the creators who have signed with us. Again, there's no reason we can't work together so that you can have access to amazing videos and that the creators of those videos share in the economics. So again, they're claiming you have no authorization to use the video and you could have gotten that authorization for $49 or hey, since we don't want to issue copyright strikes, maybe you'd like to purchase the whole library. I'm sure we could come to something economical, a bit of protection money for you, if you will. And that's the statement that Juken Media has put out there and what MXR is reacting to. Now, they call it extortion in their video. One thing I'd want to point out here is they also say that uh, they could strike down and take my channel. So what you've got here is a settlement fees that actually identifies four separate videos. Uh, so they could potentially strike on four separate videos. And YouTube's policy, if you're not familiar with it, this is for the non-YouTubers who listen to virtual legality. YouTube's policy is to essentially take your DMCA takedowns and issue copyright strikes if somebody asks for them and say, hey, if and when you get three of these, if you get three copyright strikes, your account along with any associated channels is subject to termination. All the videos uploaded to your account will be removed and you can't create new channels. Uh, now, there are ways to fight that. We've talked about the DMCA in previous videos in the past. One of the main issues that YouTube has had and has been fighting against since they've implemented all these systems is that they don't have a great ability to differentiate between folks that have legitimate ownership claims and folks that just have put together some kind of conglomerate LLC and are going out there and striking people and asking for money back or asking for things like what you are seeing here with Juken Media. Now, we don't want to accuse Juken Media of anything. In fact, for the premise of the rest of this video, we are going to assume that they own all the rights necessary to these various videos that they have claimed on. And again, there were four, and they were actually clips that were taken as part of longer videos. So I brought up here a still screen. Hey, Jukin, if you're watching this, I'm not using your video. This is just a still screen of the MXR Plays video. And you can see here how they use their videos and what exactly MXR Play does. They put their faces in the top corner. This is a video about a Papua New Guinea volcano eruption. Uh, it's about 13 seconds long in a 19 minute video. Now that's not dispositive. We're going to get back to that. Some people do the math wrong on fair use with respect to that. But this video is about 13 seconds long uh, and they mostly don't comment over it. Now I don't want to give spoilers here. You can check out this video for yourself. But one of the issues that I saw immediately is for this particular video, which is a volcano explosion and then a shockwave hitting the vide videographer, Mostly, the only person that talks here is, is the male uh, in the video, and he says, wow, that's cool, essentially. And then after the video, they talk about it a little bit more, and then they move on to the next video. One of the issues is going to be, you know, did they comment on it enough to be transformative in their usage? You say, well, Rick, it's part of a 20-minute video, and that might go towards transformation, but probably not, considering I didn't see, at least in my kind of brief view of this video, any links to other descriptions. They're not using it as a bouncing off point to talk about something else. It's just they watch this video. They say, wow, that's cool. There's a shockwave and then it hits the boat and then they move on to the next thing. And without that commentary, without kind of talking over it and that kind of thing, you can potentially get into issues. Again, we want to see if that is actually at Juken Media and we can see that pretty easily. We can take a look at their site. We see the same kind of front image on that volcano eruption, volcano eruption in Papua New Guinea. They say it was added in September of 2014. And you can see here on the right side of your screen what they would like to charge for it. Standard editorial, that's that $49 fee that they have for it. They have enhanced editorial for $99, ultra editorial for $299. And to actually advertise using the video, uh, to make commercials with it, to directly have commercial impact from the video, they ask you to inquire. Something more, something more expensive. Probably not too far afield from $299. But one thing that you definitely don't see here is $1,500. 
So you come back and you say, all right, well, if there is a copyright infringement, they could be asking for extra damages. They can use statutory uh, mechanisms to do that, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't see an easy kind of pathway from $49 for standard editorial license to $1,500 per video. That starts to look like you're just asking for more money to make that exposure high enough that essentially the person that gets that letter from you can't risk not responding can't risk at bare minimum putting up a YouTube video and complaining about it so that folks like Hogue at Virtual Legality talk about it, but also that you can't risk not paying it because if your livelihood is on your YouTube channel, now they've got you, right? Now they can say, hey, you know, $6,000 is a lot of money, but it's not $60,000 or whatever you might otherwise be earning. Maybe you should just pay us or hey, maybe you should buy our whole library. Wouldn't that be nice if we never came back around your shop and decided to break up a few things? Now, that's the state of play. You see what they did. You heard me talk about the fact that maybe there wasn't enough commentary on the video. And to get into why I said that, we have to look at what the actual Copyright Act and how fair use operate says. So if you've been in virtual legality, you know we have been in 17 USC 106 before. This is the bundle of rights that people talk about when they talk about copyright. So this is Juke and Media. Again, we are assuming that they have all the ownership rights to that video, that they have signed a license with whoever made that video and are, again, remitting some of the fees that they otherwise earn on the license to the owner of that video. And they have the rights through that license to, one, reproduce the copyrighted work, which there was a reproduction in MXR Plays. They have the right to prepare derivative works based upon that copyrighted work. Okay, so again, a derivative work is something that is based off the existence of the copyrighted work. That would be like the commentary video that you saw. So they have these exclusive rights to do these things, to distribute it, to perform it, uh, and to do these various other things related to a video. We don't want to get into pantomimes and choreographic works and things of that nature. But suffice it to say, if they hold the copyright, and we are assuming that they do, they have the exclusive right to make copies. It's a copy. Right. Right. End of story. Dunzo. Not quite. Right. Because we have fair use as the main concept. Again, still in USC, still in the actual code language itself, limitations on exclusive rights. This comes in after you've established that you have a copyright in something and says for somebody else using that copyright, hey, I'm going to use it for this reason that is specifically excluded from your rights. And the law says that's okay. The law says that is in fact authorized. It says, notwithstanding the provisions of sections 106 and 106A, 106A is uh, author attribution and things of that nature, the fair use of a copyrighted work, including such use by reproduction in copies or phono records or by any other means specified by that section for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship or research is not an infringement of copyright. Let's stop there. That's the main sentence. That's the operative sentence when we are describing fair use in the Copyright Act. If you are using something for criticism or comment, it will not be an infringement of copyright. Now, again, you say, okay, well, fine. Then, Rick, you're done. They were using it to comment, and so they're fine. Not quite. The next sentence establishes some very vague factors that are going to be used by courts to determine whether or not something falls under the bucket of that first sentence. In determining whether the use made of a work in any particular case is a fair use, is such a fair use as we just talked about, the factors to be considered shall include the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. And then also, the fact that a work is unpublished shall not itself bar a finding of fair use if such finding is made using all the previous factors that we just discussed. So a couple of things here. This is what we call a balancing test under the law. This says factors will be considered by the court. And the court will look at these various things and determine whether fair use was made based on balancing of these various factors. The other thing you might note here is that even though these are kind of quantified into four separate sections, they don't actually establish which way things go, right? This is all what we might consider unwritten law. What you understand kind of intuitively what they mean, it isn't actually written in the statute. So when we talk about the nature of the copyrighted work, that doesn't say anything. If you followed YouTube at large in the virtual legality series, you know we have talked about things like this in respect of the definition used for a website directed at children in respect of COPPA, that they just 
throw out here a bunch of factors that we will consider, and they don't actually establish which way various directions go on these things. So the statute is only really the starting place. Now, it's a good starting place because they actually have these four factors for consideration. You don't need them all. You don't need to win every paragraph. You basically just need to win the bulk of the paragraphs to be considered fair use. But when you go and you sit in a law firm's office and you ask the lawyer, is this thing that I'm doing fair use? This is the reason you get it depends from all the lawyers you might otherwise talk to. Because what we can only evaluate is how a judge or a court, if it's higher than the judge, if it's appealed, might consider these various factors. And that's our judgment. And we can give you that judgment. But we can't make guarantees on that because this is essentially someone else considering these various things and trying to come up with the answer. Now, There is a little bit more guidance given to us in various places on these particular items. And I've pulled up now the Copyright Office's website, copyright.gov, that says more information on fair use. They talk a little bit more about what these various factors mean, and they helpfully put them in four different boxes. So they say the purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. What do we mean by that? It says, hey, courts look at how the party claiming fair use is using the copyrighted work and are more likely to find that nonprofit, educational, and non-commercial uses are fair. If you're not making money off it, you get a checkbox on this because the court says, hey, if you're not making money, we are more inclined to find that the use was fair. This does not mean, however, that all nonprofit education and non-commercial uses are fair. It's just one box to check. And all commercial uses are not fair. Again, if you don't get this box, that's okay. You can still win the balancing test. Instead, courts will balance the purpose and character of the use against the other factors below. Additionally, and here's the important part for YouTube, for virtual legality, you might be saying as you watch this video, hey, Rick, you do this a lot. You comment on other people's videos. You comment on other people's commentary. You discuss legal documents that might be copyrighted by one or more of the authors of those legal documents. How does this work for you? Here's the answer. Additionally, transformative uses are more likely to be considered fair. Transformative uses are those that add something new with a further purpose or different character and do not substitute for the original use of the work. So if you're thinking about this, you say, all right, Rick, I've seen you comment on some kind of filing that was made or maybe some statutory code or maybe even a news article. How are you in fair use? I say, okay, I look at that. I read that. And then I explain things to you, hopefully. Well, uh, I give commentary. I give critique on how that was written, what problems there are with what was written, what I have as my own thoughts from a legal or business perspective. And hopefully that's transformative. That is changing the nature of the news item that was trying to be delivered in that news article or the fact that it's a brief and a claim brought in a court and it's changing it to hopefully some legal education, some legal information, something that helps people that follow virtual legality, that listen to this channel, uh, that watch it on YouTube, have a little bit of a better understanding of what that news item means. That's the purpose of this channel. That's the purpose of this particular series, virtual legality. And that's what we find ourselves in, in terms of fair use. We're transforming what we're commenting on, what we're talking about. And that's what a lot of people on YouTube find themselves in when, when related to fair use. So the primary issue that I have in just that clip, and I didn't look at all four clips, and you can look at those and you can comment on them uh, in the comments to this video. The primary issue I have in that clip is, you know, sitting over it and saying, wow, that's awesome. I don't view as particularly transformative. Now, it's only part of a bigger work and it's a very small piece, but it's also apparently the entirety of that video in terms of copyright. So that's one of the primary issues that they are going to find themselves in. And it wouldn't surprise me if the other clips on that particular list are areas where Juke and Media has found a similar kind of situation where there isn't a lot of commentary. The audio is fully played. They mostly just watch the video. And if it's the entire video, that becomes an issue as we're about to see. Nature of the copyrighted work. That was one of the issues in the statute that we just read, right? What does that even mean, nature of the copyrighted work? This factor analyzes the degree to which the work that was used relates to copyright's purpose of encouraging creative expression. Thus, using a more creative or imaginative work, such as a novel movie or song, is less likely to support a claim of fair use than using a factual work. In addition, use of an unpublished work is less likely to be considered fair. In other words, if you are using a novel movie or song in your own stuff, you're going to be less likely to be found to be using fair use because the entire purpose of the Copyright Act as a kind of philosophy is to encourage people to make new stuff. So if you are using something without remuneration, 
Uh, if you're using something without giving somebody money that is of a creative nature, then they're going to find potentially that it's not fair use more often than if you're using a technical manual and you're putting that in your uh, science fiction book. Things that make it look like, hey, I'm actually contributing to the creative environment, the creative ecosystem, and I'm using a reference to this technical manual that's going to be more likely to be found fair use. That's something that could potentially go in MXR plays favor on this, right? That wasn't a creative work. That was somebody taking video of a volcanic explosion, seeing the shockwave, having the shockwave hit the boat. You know, if they had paused that video and they were a science YouTube channel and they were talking about how the shockwave comes out of the volcano, what it means to hit that boat, what kind of speed it's going at, giving that kind of informational quality and flair, I don't think that they would have as significant a problem with transformation as what I potentially see in the issue that they have. That's why this video is called The Muddy Middle. But since they didn't do that, You've got Juke and Media saying, hey, you just took our video, you put it up entirely, and you didn't really say anything off of it. What are we supposed to do? And while I think that the prices they've given are potentially extortionate, while that might be an issue in and of itself, their actual claim here is not as obvious for somebody like me looking at it and saying, well, it's clear that this is fair use. I don't know that it is. The third factor, amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. Under this factor, courts look at both the quantity and quality of the copyrighted material that was used. If the use includes a large portion of the copyrighted work, fair use is less likely to be found. So that's even with respect to a short video, right? The Juke and Media video of this volcanic explosion isn't terribly long. And so what is used in the MXR Plays video isn't terribly long either. But it is primarily most of what the video is. Uh, I'm not sure if they made any kind of smallish cuts. It looked to be about the same length when I did my review here. And also it says, hey, that said, some courts have found use of an entire work to be fair under certain circumstances. And in other contexts, using even a small amount of the copyrighted work was determined not to be fair because the selection was an important part or the heart of the work. So even if they did make certain small edits to that video, and I can't confirm or deny that just based on what I could see, even if they did, it's clear that the heart of the video was the explosion and the shockwave hitting the boat. And they used both of those clips in what they were commenting on. So they used the heart of what this video was. So if you're keeping track at home, you know, their purpose maybe wasn't transformative. Uh, it, it maybe was just a news or factual work rather than a creative one. So they might be okay there but they also used basically every bit of the video that Juke and Media was trying to license or sell. So they've got an issue here with fair use factors if I'm just looking at this uh, from hopefully a non-biased perspective. Then they say effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. Here courts review whether and to what extent the unlicensed use harms the existing or future market for the copyright owner's original work. In assessing this factor, courts consider whether the use is hurting the current market for the original work and or whether the use could cause substantial harm if it were to become widespread. Now on this, I think the answer is no. I think they have a better fair use position on this fourth factor. This is basically designed to look around and say what you did, what you made, can it substitute for the video in and of itself? The answer here is because it's not transformative, maybe, but because it's also part of a longer 20 minute video, because there's a box in the upper right corner, it probably doesn't substitute for what Juke and Media is trying to sell. Now they might claim that it does, that may be why they're asking for $1,500, but I think that's a difficult case for them to make. So ultimately we go through these four factors and you say, Rick, I'm keeping track at home. I think two of those factors you said were for fair use, give or take, and two of those factors were against fair use, give or take, where does that leave us? And I say, hey, I don't know. That leaves us in a place where Juke and Media's claim that fair use was violated or, or that fair use isn't available to them as a defense to copyright infringement is probably plausible. That they aren't simply sending this letter as a fully kind of gangster extortionate move. They aren't just saying, hey, this is not fair use. It is infringing our copyright and they really should have thought about it harder. Uh, that... At the end of the day, if I'm their lawyers or I'm giving them advice, I say, yeah, you know, I'm not sure I would ask for $6,000, but you probably aren't going to get kicked out of court for not even considering fair use. And you've probably got reasons to at least argue that fair use wasn't available on that clip in particular. I'm not speaking to the other three clips because I didn't go and find them in all the various videos. So we're in a situation now where we're talking about this and it looks very unfair to the people that made that YouTube video. It's a very small portion of the video. However, maybe they don't have fair use as a defense. Maybe they do, but it's an open question. So the secondary question here is, 
Let's say that they do. Let's say that ultimately the court would find, hey, this is fair use. It's a pretty short clip. They have that big box in the corner. They do talk over it a little bit. Come on, Juke and Media. Asking for $1,500 for this small clip when you otherwise sell rights for $49. We have you on the record in commentary actually taking a picture of your own comment saying $49 would have been fine for this and then asking for an order of magnitude more. You know, frankly, that starts to look like an unlawful threat. And why does unlawful threat matter to us so much? Well, in this case, we go to a different section of the USC. We actually go to 18 USC 1951, interference with commerce by threats or violence. Whoever in any way or degree obstructs, delays, or affects commerce or the movement of any article or commodity in commerce by robbery or extortion or attempts or conspires so to do or commits or threatens physical violence to any person or property in furtherance of a plan or purpose to do anything in violation of this section, you gotta love statutory code, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. And for our purposes here, the definition is important. The term extortion means the obtaining of property from another with his consent induced by wrongful use of actual or threatened force, violence or fear, or under color of official right. So broadly, it means going and threatening someone unlawfully. You see here the use of the word wrongful, wrongful use of actual or threatened force, and going and asking for property, going and getting property in this particular instance. And this is a pretty common concept. So I've brought up the federal law here, which talks about interstate commerce, things that they need to do for a constitutional hook in order to give them the rights to actually make a law like this. I don't know where MXR Plays is. I don't know where Jukin Media is. But there are other jurisdictions, California, various states, that will have their own kind of extortion law on the books. But the premise is this. If you go and you send a letter or you make a communication and you are using unlawful means to try to go get money or property from someone, you could potentially be liable for extortion. Now, the issue is... That happens all the time to some respect, as we've talked about earlier in this video, with threats of lawsuits, right? We at Hogue Law have sent cease and desist letters after consulting with our clients and talking about what issues they might have, whether it's a violation of a non-competition agreement or a violation of a license that they've entered into with respect to their intellectual property, things of that nature, where you have somebody breaching a contract, otherwise potentially liable to your client, and you send a letter and says, hey, you are breaching our contract, please stop that. Or, p- or please pay us these damages. And if you don't, we're going to have to consider our legal remedies and go to a litigator and potentially bring you to court. And that's totally legitimate because we've got a reason to believe that we've had some rights or obligations that have been uh, breached that are owed to us. And we are hopefully making a claim of damages that are relevant to what it is that we've actually experienced. However, if we start to make misrepresentations in going after that lawsuit, if we start to make claims that are otherwise going to be considered unlawful, then you can get into an area, and this happens with lawyers, as we're about to see in this NBC News article, where you can be brought up on extortion charges. If you don't remember this story from pretty early last year, Michael Avenatti and Nike, when does a lawful threat cross into extortion? Now, I don't usually use NBC News articles for legal analysis, but this was actually pretty good. Like most news articles, it has a few things that it kind of glides over, but I think it's useful enough for us to kind of get the groundwork for talking about this. It says, hey, analysis, threatening a lawsuit is legal, just like we talked about. But if Michael Avenatti engaged in misrepresentation, such as when he said he could ruin Nike's reputation, that could be considered extortion. And if you're not familiar with this story, basically he said, you know, I can threaten to sue you. You have to settle with me. Uh, and if you don't, I can take a huge amount of money off your market capitalization. I can just kill your stocks. I can get all you CEOs fired. You better settle with me. And he was brought up on extortion charges. It says here, attorney Michael Avenatti has been charged in federal court in the Southern District of New York with trying to extort up to $25 million from Nike. Avenatti was charged with a conspiracy to transmit extortionate communications. This crime is committed when someone transmits in interstate commerce a threat to a corporation's reputation with the intent to extort money. The statutory maximum is two years. Avenatti was also charged with Hobbs Act extortion, which is the obtaining of property from another with consent induced by wrongful use of actual or threatened fear of economic harm. That's what we just looked at. They will try to dismiss the case, going and paraphrasing some of this article, because it's always okay to bring a lawsuit, even if it's meritless. As this article continues, a lawsuit actually filed in court by lawful means 
cannot be wrongful as defined by the Hobbes Act. But note the heavy lifting that some of that language is doing. By lawful means, you have to have reason to actually bring the claim. And if you don't, if you're just trying to get somebody to do something for you and you're using the legal system as essentially your big hammer, that can be a problem. They go on to say, if courts started holding that meritless lawsuits were extortionate, every unsuccessful lawsuit would lead to an extortion claim. We don't want that. We want people that have had their rights infringed upon, that have otherwise been wronged, to be able to avail of themselves the legal system. We want that. So we don't want to just have everything be extortion. However, on the other hand, sometimes threatened litigation crosses the line and is extortionate. Very helpful so far, right? We're very much sitting in this lawyer's uh, office and having him say, it depends. The federal appellate courts have held that when a lawsuit is not pursued exclusively by lawful methods, threats of litigation may constitute extortion. Now, I looked at that link. That's actually a case where the court does say, hey, you can have lawsuits that are extortionate. However, there's a lot of muddy facts in that particular case. They have an actual situation where officials are being bribed and claims are being made. But for our purposes, the most important part of that case is the claim that making misrepresentations about what your rights are, what your damages actually were, and trying to essentially raise the price of not settling with you in a manner that is false is a, is a kind of fraud, is a kind of artifice to deceive, as the law might say. And if you go that far, then you can get into issues. Uh, as we've talked about prior to this uh, in this video, that's a muddy middle in and of itself, right? It's not just copyright. It's not just fair use. Extortion is uh, a, a very unusual avenue to go and to claim for a lawful kind of threat. Uh, and so what we've got here is trying to analyze whether or not Jukin Media has gone a step too far by actually having in place commentary that $49 would have been fine. Here's $6,000 of fees we're perfectly happy to walk away with. And whether or not that actually constitutes extortion would be a matter for a court to determine if and when the, the court actually took it up. Uh, and so, you know, if you are MXR, maybe you could go, maybe you could go talk to a federal agency and say, hey, I'm being extorted here. But $6,000 YouTuber, this particular issue where they maybe do have an infringement actually on the books, this is something that is unlikely for somebody uh, as an agency level to actually jump in and, and kind of protect you on. So you've got those issues if you're MXR as well. Going forward in this article, a court considering whether Avenatti's threats were lawful or extortionate would look at several factors. Avenatti allegedly tried to magnify the pressure on Nike by inflating the perceived magnitude of Nike's potential exposure and the perceived likelihood that the exposure would result in massive liability for the company. So if we assume that there aren't actually $1,500 of damages experienced by Jukin Media and $49 is a little bit closer to what we're actually talking about here. If we assume that even though the fair use analysis might be tied, it's still something that they should think about before actually bringing a claim on because fair use, if they do have fair use, they shouldn't be able to ask for any money at all. And if we assume that they are then going and threatening to close the channel, actually getting on Twitter and increasing kind of the pressure on MXR, actually getting into their own social media feeds and saying, hey, you know, you got to settle this. We put a comment in your video. We put a comment on your Twitter feed. We are coming after you. And if you don't settle this, we would take away your channel. Then is that all legitimate? And that's an open question. And I think if I'm Jukin Media, they're probably acting a little bit too far at this point. You send the letter and you let it go. You don't, you don't kind of argue this in the court of public opinion because at the end of the day, it's going to be the legal claim that wins out for you if you're Jukin. And if you don't, uh, if, if you lose on an extortion claim, it's going to be based on the fact that you went out there and you did all this stuff to try to get them pressured to give you this settlement. That's the kind of thing that results in an Avenatti type uh, analysis says, hey, if Avenatti waged a pressure campaign premised on misrepresentations, then that likely takes the threats outside of the protective sphere of litigation. If this pressure campaign relied upon dissemination of false information or exaggerated estimates of Nike's damages, then that might be extortionate. And that's the answer, right? It might be extortionate. It might be fair use. It might be copyright infringement. This is the world in which we live, unfortunately, and this is the world that YouTubers have to kind of deal with on an ongoing basis. And this is why, if you've looked at virtual legality and if you've looked at my previous stuff, you know, I do think in the digital world, when we're talking about memes, when we're talking about viral videos, commentary on the same, we really do need certain steps 
to reform copyright and the Copyright Act in general. It is not built for this. It was not built for the complete and total copying of very small videos across entire internet websites that you can then put your commentary on over and have a successful commercial enterprise through a service like YouTube. The Copyright Act still talks about pantomime and phono records for Pete's sake. And it is more than time for a review of the Copyright Act for reform that helps get not just people that are infringed upon. You know, the Juke and Medias of the world, they didn't have to ask for $1,500 a video, but they might well have been infringed upon in this particular instance. And we want people to be able to have a business model like Juke and Media is advocating to say, hey, I'm going to go collect this video ownership. I'm going to go license it for myself. I'm going to license it out to people who want to use it. We're going to get money for that service, but the owners are going to get money for that service. Hopefully the YouTubers are going to get money for making their commentary video and everybody wins. We generally want to advocate for that model, but we don't want to advocate for extortion. We don't want to advocate for trolling. The last thing I will say on this is what we talked about early in the video is that the mechanism for this is very, very kind of artificial. Right. We've talked about this in virtual legality before, but primarily the DMCA takedown notice is what we're talking about here. This is a claim that someone makes on a YouTube channel in particular, but anywhere else on the Internet that says, hey, you, YouTube, as a service provider, have put up something that is infringing. I will attest to the fact that it is infringing. And so you should take it down if you want to avoid liability. And YouTube basically reacts to that in every single instance. They take it down. And as we saw in their own description of events, if you get three of these copyright strikes that are really bad, uh, then they are going to potentially take down your channel. And like everything else, if you make a lot of money for YouTube, you probably get a little bit of extra dispensation on that particular item. Uh, but that's for another virtual legality video for another time. But one of the things that came up here is that the DMCA doesn't actually explicitly talk about fair use. So there's been a lot of questions about whether or not somebody that goes and makes a claim, hey, I clearly own this video. Do I have to consider fair use before I make the claim to strike that video? And it's a, a little bit away now. It's uh, September 2015. It's the Lens versus Universal Music Corp case that we have talked about in virtual legality before. But basically what this whole thing says, and I will link this particular article from Jones Day in the description to this video, it says, yes, you have to consider whether it's something is fair use before you claim it is unauthorized. It's one of the reasons why that commentary from Juke and Media is trying to hide the ball a little bit. They have to do an analysis of whether or not it is fair use. It says the Ninth Circuit held that the Copyright Act unambiguously contemplates fair use as a use authorized by law. And accordingly, a copyright holder must consider the existence of fair use before sending a takedown notification under 512C, the point in the DMCA that talks about takedowns. It says, if a copyright holder ignores or neglects our unequivocal holding that it must consider fair use before sending a takedown notification, it is liable for damages for a wrongful takedown. If, however, a copyright holder forms a subjective, good faith belief, the allegedly infringing material does not constitute fair use, we are in no position to dispute the copyright holder's belief, even if we would have reached the opposite conclusion. That said, a copyright holder who pays lip service to the consideration of fair use by claiming it formed a good faith belief when there is evidence to the contrary is still subject to that liability. And this article from Jones Day actually goes on to kind of analyze the decision by the court, but it says, yeah... So you've got a broad kind of area of discretion. If you are Juke and Media, as long as you went, you put a memo in the file, you considered whether something is fair use or not, you kind of did what we did here in virtual legality and came to the determination that while the factors are somewhat balanced two by two, the two that are on your side are more dispositive and so it's not fair use, that if you've got that thought process in place, and that probably should be communicated to the person that you are actually claiming is infringing upon your stuff. If you've got that thought process in place, even if you are later proved to be wrong, the court's going to allow the initial DMCA claim. But if you don't have that analysis, if you didn't bother to make the analysis, or if you've actually got evidence in your email chains or otherwise that suggests, hey, you know that it might be fair use, and you go and you make the claim anyway, you're going to be in big trouble. And that's kind of the current state of play with the DMCA. That's kind of what people are dealing with right now is that because of the automated nature of it with respect to YouTube and other services, we are still trying to figure out continually exactly where the line should be on what somebody that claims ownership of an intellectual property should be able to do under the DMCA, what that counter notice should be able to do. And ultimately, you know, the way the DMCA works, and you can check out earlier videos in virtual legality if you look for DMCA on this channel to talk about more specifics on that law itself, is that ultimately, if there's a big enough fight, you got to go to federal court and have it out there. And as we've talked about, the primary issue with copyright, 
the primary issue that MXR plays now finds itself in. And the primary reason that you can media can put them in this position is that use of a federal court system, use of the Copyright Act is very, very expensive. And because you can media can point to that video in Papua New Guinea, can say, hey, it's ours. We've shown that it's ours. We charge people $49 at minimum for its use. They refused to go and get that from us court. At bare minimum, that's probably enough to not get it kicked out immediately. And if you don't get the case kicked out immediately, you're talking about paying lawyers. You're talking about paying for potential discovery. You're talking about all the expenses that are inherent in litigation. And when we're talking about federal litigation, we're talking about a lot more than $6,000. So one of the ways a scheme like this works, if you think Juken Media is entirely in the wrong, is they go and they say, okay, this is very important to your livelihood. Okay, we think you have the money to pay this. Okay, if you want to dispute or make trouble for us, you'd have to take us to federal court. And if you did that, you would lose more money than the $6,000. So we have picked out this amount of money and we think this makes sense for what you are going to pay us. Is that calculation in and of itself extortionate? It can certainly look that way from a kind of common law perspective. I have my doubts because I think they have a certain amount of plausibility with what they are bringing as a claim. I think the amounts they are asking for and the way they are pressuring them on social media and elsewhere is its own problem. And if I were advising them, I would tell them to stop that immediately. But is it extortionate? That's an open question. And even if you can use that as some kind of defense, you're probably already in federal court. Your channel's probably already been shut down. You probably don't already have the money to pay the lawyers to do either the copyright defense or the extortion claim. And then where does that leave you? And unfortunately, that is the rock and the hard place that MXR Plays now finds themselves in. And no, it's not fair. No, it's not fair on the Copyright Act side. No, it's not fair that fair use is so vague and unknowable. No, it's not fair that extortion maybe doesn't walk up quite to the line that could defend them in this specific instance. None of this is fair. However, it is the way the current law reads, and I do recommend reform across the bar on all this stuff, especially as it deals with digital media and the internet, but that's not the world we live in right now, and unfortunately, that is the muddy middle of copyright, and unfortunately, that is virtual legality for today. If you like this video, I know the subject matter isn't necessarily that fun, but if you liked it, if you think it's interesting, if you want to share it around with people, please do so. Please like, please subscribe to the channel. We love having these conversations and discussions, especially on YouTube, the interface of business and law, and all the things that go into what we're dealing with in the modern area, whether that's video games, pop culture, or otherwise. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.